Welcome to the Nick Bear Podcast. I've spent the past decade as a CEO building an industry-leading supplement brand. There's a story, there's a mission. Serving in the U.S. Army. First video in Korea. And creating a community of inspiring leaders. The mission isn't changing, but it's evolving. This is it. I'm a different person now. Through powerful, unfiltered conversations. You have to be careful with entrepreneurship. You can get hurt. My mission is to help you unlock your full potential and create the life you desire. Camera's rolling and we're on. I'm your host, Nick Bear. Enjoy the episode. Before jumping into this episode, I want to thank you for tuning in and spending your time with me. Every watch and listen truly does matter. Now, we've decided to not take on any sponsors for this podcast because we don't want to interrupt your listening experience. But if you do want to support me, you can head over to bpnsups.com for all of your performance, endurance, and wellness supplement needs. We offer a wide range of products from amazing tasting protein powders, effective pre-workouts, green superfoods, multivitamins, sleep support, and much more. I spent the last decade building this brand, community, and product offering, and I'm extremely thankful that it has helped so many people. So if you are in need of a new supplement routine, head over to bpnsups.com and use code NICKBEAR10 to save 10% off your order. Now let's jump right into this episode. Today on the podcast, we have Sam Okanola, professional natural bodybuilder, husband, father, fitness coach, army veteran, and now hybrid athlete. The resume just builds and builds. It's like your ERB in the (laughs) army. My packet. Yeah, you just put it on the back. (laughs) You know, like people, when they leave the military, they have their whole ERB plastered on the back of their windshield. Mm -hmm. It's like that. Mm -hmm. I I never got to that level. I never got to that level. But hey, proud of of everything. Proud of all the uh, accolades, I should say. Well, I got a quote I want to kick off with that I heard you say, and I'd love to know what this means to you. Yeah. And that quote is, the only way forward is one step at a time. What's the significance of that quote and and meaning for you? Uh, I I vividly remember um, exactly um, when that quote was. And it's, so I was recently training for a a marathon last last year. I was going to do a marathon in October, but I had to pull out that because I had ITB issues. And uh, my coach, Casey, a fellow BPN, um, athlete and uh, I reach out to her it's one of those things that after each week of running you have okay 10 miles 12 miles and every every mile it feels like it feels like 10 miles in I'm like man another 16.2 miles like how am I gonna finish this like it's just so daunting and uh, and I know okay after this recover do the next thing and 15 miles came around uh, 15 miles I mean it broke me I'm like, there is no way I'm doing this. I mean, I remember like finishing 10 miles. I remember when I went to uh, my in-laws house, they live in the backcountry road, this long, I mean, like, feel, I mean, it feels like a, a film set. Like there was nothing else, but just windmills. I'm like, this is great. You know, 10 miles felt great. The last five miles, I literally had to like interval <laughs> five, five miles. Just like run, to, walk? Yes, just to finish it, just to say I finished it. I remember I called uh, Casey, I'm like, man, this, 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 this ain't it. This ain't it. Of course, she's like, no, just take the time. Yes, it's it's fresh right now. Take the time, recover. Uh, just show up the next time and just run and show up. Just do it. See how you feel. And we adjust. All right, cool. And lo and behold, uh, that following week was probably the when I actually understand what a run is high feel like. Because coming from 15 miles, oh, 10 miles and 5 miles of I mean, intervaling, I mean, intervaling um, that part out, 18 miles literally was like the best run I ever had. I mean, high, negative splits on like the last four miles. I mean, you can't tell me anything. It's like one of the best feelings uh, ever. On top of the world. I mean, arm fist, fist bumping everybody on the trail. I'm like, man, let's go. And it just took me the time like, so if I if I quit at that 15 miles or 10 miles, um, I, would never, I would never, I mean, experience that 18 mile high. So the best... Shout out to my coach again. The best uh, thing for me to do at the time is literally, literally one step at a time, one step at a time, one step at a time. 
some runners like to look up. I'm, I'm just going to look down. I don't want to see where I'm going. I just want to look down and just literally just watch my feet one step at a time. And that's what got me to the point of that 18 mile that I experienced that high. And if I would have quit and call case, I'm like, I don't know, man, this is hard. I don't think, I mean, it's, it's just so big, like 15 miles. Like I couldn't finish 15 miles, not to even comprehend 26.2. So I remember Dan and I put that up again. It's just, I mean, a lot of tasks just seem overwhelming because you overthink a lot of things, but you literally simplify it down to just literally one step at a time, whatever that step is, just figure it out. Just take a step and figure out what that step is. Take a step and figure it out. Whatever the outcome is, you figure it out. Because if you just stay in that position, like stagnant, stagnant and not take that step, you literally are going to be in that position without any sort of momentum moving forward. Yeah, when I think back to my first two marathons, it was you know, running for the first 15 to 16 miles. Mm -hmm. And at last nine to 10 was a run walk yeah. approach. And when I first started running, you know, I, the reason I love the quote comparison is the thief of joy yep. is because I would see people who were running the entire marathon. They were running strong across that finish line, like <laughs> sub three. And I'm thinking that is impossible. That is literally impossible. Mm -hmm. And then I went out and ran my first marathon and there I am run walking that last nine to 10, which when you realize that you are run walking 10 miles, mm -hmm. I that's mean, a, that, that that's hurts. A, that's a lot. <laughs> that's that's, a lot. that's, uh, that's unconditioned running. Mm -hmm. But you used to learn it the hard way and you have to start somewhere. Yep. And that's why I love running. That's why I love talking to people through their transition and evolution of running mm -hmm. because I've gone through it as well. I mean, my last marathon, I ran 248. When you told me when I, if you would have told me I would have ran a 248 marathon when I ran a 415, I, mean, I, believe it, huh? I would say there's no no way, <laughs> not the same person. Yep. You know, I started my fitness journey after the army or through the army with with a strength background, yep. strength and bodybuilding. You've had a strength and bodybuilding background for an extended period of time. And if you've earned and achieved a pro natural body building card mm -hmm. through that journey, why did you want to start running? Like, what was the reason that you started introducing that into your training? Um, <clears throat> you and I have a similar uh, journey when it comes to running, meaning you were in the military. And I'll literally just have a conversation with somebody today that military is not uh, shaped or uh, conditioned for you to get better at running. You got six miles. <laughs> you got three miles. Half fast going to get there. Go. Send it. That's it. You might get, you know, in the groups or A, B, C, or whatever, but... Relatively speaking, it's not, oh, yeah, let's taper, you know, let's program this right. No, it's just full set. So as soon as I got out of the military, I literally through my running shoes. I'm like, nah, never again. I did the same thing. <laughs> never again. So the first thing I did was like, okay, I, went, I mean, met up with a few of my high school buddies. I just went to, I mean, I want to start training. I want to strength train. And I just, I, and coming from somebody that played soccer in high school, I mean, fitness level was, I mean, top notch. My two mile time in the military, I think was like 11 something uh, at the time. So it, it used to be sort of enjoyable, but when I got out, that was just the last thing I would, I don't want to rock march. I want to run. I, I, I no, none of that. So tr uh, fast forward to strength training, strength training, was just like a different, like, you know, it was, it was a hangout. It was a, it was a social hour, so to speak, uh, with the group of guys that I went to high school with, we all chit chat, you know, just have a good time. So sh strength training, that was, that was, that was there. Um, fast forward, bodybuilding, uh, again, fall into the right crew of people that I went into bodybuilding at the time, trained for my first show, got my pro card, uh, did a bunch of bodybuilding shows. Then um, I started having knee issues. And that knee issue, um, so the knee issue essentially was uh, knee, knee extension was great. Obviously, when you're running, a lot of knee extension takes place. Knee flexion, like squatting, was like challenging. If you know me, I love a good leg session. Like I would take that any day over any body part. It, because it's challenging because most people probably will quit if I'm training legs, I think that makes me want, want it even more. Most it, people opt not to train legs at all. I will. I will I'm, the, I'm the guy that travels on, you know, I know like back in when we used to go, like fit, I mean, ex, um, expos and you travel all day. Nobody wants to train legs. I'm like, nope, I want to train legs. That's me. Uh, granted, like it was not, it was, a, it was a body part I'm trying to improve on too. So I feel like, you know, I owe it to myself. I want to improve. I need to make sure I keep that volume or keep that training intensity. But anyways, I couldn't run. And all of a sudden, I'm um, like, okay, what's the next hardest thing that I can do that can at least like simulate, you know, some sort of, you know, training legs hard. I'm like, huh, I guess running. I'm like, wait, okay, let's try running. I'm like running doesn't hurt. So that was for like the two weeks I was 
that was what I was doing. Like when I was supposed to train legs, I used to train, I train legs twice a week. I was running. And then uh, I know something, my wife and I's relationship is exactly, they see two of us, I'm like, oh, I know this dynamic. He's a lifter, you're the runner. I'm like, we'll give it away, <laughs> we'll give it away, my size. But uh, watching, uh, and something I've always wanted to do was run with her or do some sort of race. And we were very competitive. I used to, I'm like, I can run easily, 5K, like what, six minute pace, that's easy. No, I'm like 850, I'm go all out, bunk. And it's like, okay. Like she passes me as she laughs. I'm like, oh. but I don't have it. Anyways, fast forward. I'm like, you know what? Now that I cannot train legs, maybe it's a time to actually focus on something that's easily as hard as training, you know, um, uh, training for a, a half marathon. So I went on the app, you know, there's many apps out there. You can just grab I'm like, cool. I jumped on it. I followed the app. I trained. I'm not sure. I mean, looking back now, there are things I would have changed knowing what I know now. But again, I just, you don't know what you don't know. So signed up for that and did my first uh, half marathon with her. Um, 2000 and I believe 2020 was the first one that I did with her. And uh, that's how I kind of caught the bug. And I slowed down a little bit from then. And the following year, um, I think got to a space where I just want to challenge myself too. And, and the conversation around that is just an internal conversation to like, seeing a guy like you, seeing a guy like me, like you are supposed to be the definition of fitness. Like you should be able to go run a mile without gasping for breath. Mm -hmm. You should be able to run two miles. Like that's the, you know, definition of fitness for me. And I feel like that was a gap in how I feel. And again, I'm getting older. And I got to the point also that strength training was not really challenging for me. It's fun for me. Like you, you, don't, you don't have to force me to go work out. Running till this day, it's still hard for me. I look at my shoes, I'm like, the running joke uh, with my wife uh, is, I tell her I'm gonna go run uh, at seven o'clock. She's like, okay, you mean eight? I'm like, yeah, you're right. Cause I'll stall, overstretch, contemplate. Why are you doing this? You do this. It's just, I go through the pace, then I pick up my shoes, put my, sh my shoes on, run. I'm like, the first mile is always like the hardest mile. I'm like, body's just trying to figure out, okay, what are we doing here? Then two miles in, three miles in, you start falling into a groove, you settle in a little bit. And you start seeing the benefit of what running does compared to what strength training doesn't really do for me anymore. Still enjoy it, but in, in terms of the challenging aspect of things or, or the uncomfortable thing for me, running does that for me, not strength training. I was actually just having this conversation with my wife last night. I'm, I'm now falling into this spot in my life where I like my run more than I like my strength training. Mm -hmm. And it's not that I don't love strength training anymore, but it's the way you say, like, it doesn't challenge me in the way that a run challenges me. Yep. I like strength training in the afternoon and evening. I like running in the morning. Part of that is the choice. Like there's a hard choice of waking up, getting out of your bed, going for that morning run. Yep. That first mile always sucks. You're just mm -hmm. shaking everything out and then you fall into this rhythm. But if I had to choose between one or the other now and I could only choose one, it would be that run. For me, I get more of a challenge out of it physically and mentally. Mm -hmm. I get more like solitude and mental clarity out of my run than I do strength training. But I do want to, I want to take it back a step before we go a little bit forward. Mm -hmm. Talking about running in the military. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if there's like, if there's one mission I have in my life uh, before I die. Uh, it's helping the military learn yes, how to run. Yes. When I was in the army, it's like, it's like you said, we would go out and we'd go balls to the wall, send full send. Yep. We never knew how far we were running because nope. no one had a Garmin or a GPS watch. We just went kind of based off of time, mm -hmm. but we never improved. Nope. And if I think back, cause I was in the infantry, if I think back to training and working out outside of PT hours, mm -hmm. groups of guys would go to the gym, throw weights around, everyone wanted to get bigger and stronger. Mm -hmm. The only people that were really running outside of work, there were two groups of people. One, you were probably overweight and you had to run remedial or you're going to get, yeah, remedial PT mm -hmm. or you're about to get kicked out of the army. <laughs> and two, you were a high achiever. <laughs> yep. And you were like trying to show off. You have the in between. <laughs> and like everyone else was going to the gym. Yep. But I'm I'm always mind boggled, at least like conventional army, conventional military, like put aside the SEALs, the Rangers, special operations. 
conventional military, it's a shit show. It's a soup sandwich for running. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, no, again, we're not, no, I, I think it's the mindset, the culture of like, no, I mean, got to break you off, you know, like that's, you know, the suffering aspect of running and not really, uh, let's improve performance. Right. Um, again, I remember like when uh, a guy, somebody might just be, I was stationed in uh, Korea, uh, Camp uh, Red Cloud, and there's a place called Radar Hill. Radar Hill is almost like a rite of passage when you come in. That's where they, they take you to break you off. Uh, who's new? You originally like, fall out. You fall out. You know, your squad leader takes you. You go to Radar Hill. And you see when people coming back, like, oh, yeah, they got broke off. <gasps> With the breathing, the sweating. I mean, it's like nice, you know, incline, six-mile incline. And it's almost like, a, you know, a pat on the back, like, yep, I did, yeah, we did that. But as far as improving performance, improving PT, I mean, improving our physical fitness, it's not, I don't think it's skewed around let's break them off. But the more opportunity we get uh, to break you off and not focus on maybe recovery, uh, maybe slow runs, like all zone two is actually what we need more of. That's how we build fitness instead of just, you know, going zone four, full on sand all the time. Uh, but I would say I think they are doing better. Maybe another aspect, but not just so much about running, obviously the new APFT and things like that. Uh, but no, I think it's just the culture of like, you know, full sand all the time. You know, let's, let's empty the tank. How fast can we run? How far how hard can we push? And that's the only way. Yeah. So I think they're doing a good job because I think, again, obviously with the new, you know, science uh, coming out around fitness, that's one of the reasons why I think they changed the APFT. Like, okay, we need to make this more adaptable to what we actually do outside of the push-ups and the run and the sit-ups. So. I think there's a lot of education to, to kind of transfer into that space too. Like I even think about my running shoes when I was in the army, I wore the same pair of running shoes for all four years. Yep. <laughs> this, a Asics. Yep. Asics. <laughs> yep. Like the, yeah, like the, the PX. Yeah. I yeah. wore the Asics and the yep. PX and dude, by the time I left, like those things had holes in the soles. And yep. now I change out my shoes now every 250, 300 miles. And the way I can tell I need new shoes is if I start having these small, just like aches and pains mm -hmm. in my ankles or my knees or my hips, mm -hmm. I know I need to change my shoes out. I change my shoes out and instantly those little pains go away. Yeah. No, I mean, it's funny. <laughs> I think everybody had the same pair of shoes. Like, it's like, I mean, I think it was like part of, uh, they only had a few options to choose from, I think. Uh, but no, I vividly remember that. And again, I think when I took, when I threw my shoes off, when I got, when I got home from the army, it was one rightfully I needed to run my way anyways. But no, I think again, it's, uh, it's, it's, I think they're doing job. They're doing a better job now. I'm far, I mean, I'm not really, uh, too invested in like how the mill, I know the new, uh, P PFT test has changed deadlifts and, and carries and things like that. But I think the run is still the same. You still got a two mile, uh, you got a two mile, you got some drags and pulls in there. But I think again, uh, it's a new age. You can use the same tactics that you use it back, you know, back in uh, 20 to 10, 15 years ago. You have to adapt to the new way of training. And I think they're doing a better job uh, than that. I'm not too, again, I'm not too embedded in that area, but I, I'm positive there are things they put in place in terms of like, you know, okay, how they train, how military readiness, so to speak. So that would be cool to see, um, you know, if I can, you know, get some sort of feedback from somebody. Like, I mean, what's the, you know, what's the new approach now? Is it, hey, we're doing sergeant's time on Thursday or doing like, you know, every day's a running day or we mixing that up or if we're running, okay, we are, there's a pacer that's going to control the pace, it's his own two pace or things like that. But uh, I think that would, I mean, that would be something pretty awesome uh, to see moving forward, especially if you're trying to, you know, lead the future like of the army. Huge opportunity. Oh, yeah. Like a lot of low hanging fruit there. So you really, you started running because so you started running again post-military mm -hmm. because you were injured and running was a way for you to keep training lower body yep. outside of traditional strength training. Mm -hmm. Did you experience any injuries from running when you started running? Because for me, that's one of the biggest questions that I get from a lot of people that follow my content mm -hmm. is they start running and they experience uh, plantar fasciitis runner's knee, hip issues, imbalances. I'm curious what you experienced. I can, I can, I can speak to all the above because I've had all the above. And I think, uh, again, you don't know what you don't know. And later on now, that's when I'm learning. Like, okay, there's a lot of correlation. I mean, you, you agree to this too. There's a lot of correlation between running and strength training. Uh, most injuries that people have when it comes to strength training uh, outside of just a freakish accident, it's typically from poor load management and improper technique over time. 
Um, poor load management, meaning you're just doing too much too soon. You're ramping up intensity too much too soon. Same thing goes with running. If you ramp up mileage too, too soon, it's, easy, it's an easy way for you to get injured. Um, if you run it without a good running technique, especially for a bigger dude like me, it's easier way for you know for you to get injured. I'm saying it's easier because one, um, I plantar fasciitis, I had it. It's almost like, I remember uh, my coach again said, "Listen, I mean, almost like plantar fasciitis, it's a rite of passage uh, to run I had it. it too. Yeah, yeah, like once you have it, now you understand. Okay, this is what I got to do: take care of your feet, your shoes, uh, roll out your feet, you know, take care of that. And as soon as I start paying attention, taking care of that, it kind of just went away, right? Strengthen your feet, um, and that." I was training for a marathon. I had to pull out after mile 18 because I had ITB syndrome. If you know what ITB is, ITB is um, essentially when the out, outer part of your knee is hurting. And just like any injuries that you have when it comes to fitness, when it comes to strength training or running, it's typically just a symptom of something else. And again, it's a lot of hip tightness, which again, I found out from, you know, uh, my running technique, uh, things I, I'm, I spent my cadence were too low for a guy my size. And essentially what you, the, the more, uh, the more efficient you are at running, especially from a, for a bigger dude, the better off you are. That means improving your running technique. So focusing on, again, allowed me the opportunity to uh, have one, have a correlation between strength training. Like, okay, if I want to get good at strength training, this is what I did. Okay, this I have to sh- use similar focus when it comes to running too. And I had a guy reach out to me and I think I had, uh, uh, when I talked about, I, you know, uh, messed around and just like, you know, showed up for a half marathon, like three days notice and I ended up PR and it's like, well, I'm inspired and he wants to do this. And like, no, 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 I'm not suggesting you should do what I did. Um, ideally speaking, yes, you can find out what your, you know, what your baseline is. That's good. If you want to challenge yourself, but he actually did it. You got to tell, um, got a DM from him this morning and he did it. I actually did pretty well. I'm like, okay, now I know you, you fired up, slow down. Like pay, reel it back in a little bit. Now slowly ramp up because that's easy way for you to get hurt because you're ramping up too fast too soon. So I had all the injuries. I had the ITB issues. I had the hip issues. I had the knee issues. But again, uh, a lot of my experience from the strength training when I use that uh, when it comes to running allowed me to sort of manage that a little bit better. I mean, I'm just getting back from like ITB just because again I understand it. Wow, okay my running in, uh, cadence and my running technique actually plays a lot uh, in my uh, staying injury free when I run. Uh, but at the same time, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating to see the correlation between strength training, which again, you, I mean, you can draw a lot of parallels from a running um, and strength training at the same time. But no, uh, the biggest advice I think I'll give to anyone if you're trying to run, yes, uh, you know, start slow. I mean, you said it multiple times, slowly ramp up. Don't ramp up too fast, too soon. Run your easy runs, easy. <laughs> Run your hard runs, hard. Um, but it's, I know it's hard if you start running to like, you know, it sucks. It's one mile, but I just want to get it over with. So the idea is I'm just going to send it and be done with it. Just like strength training, when you go to the gym, I've been trained for a while, you show up to the gym. I'm going to train six days a week. And what's what happens? You're too sore. You don't like the feeling. You're like, man, this sucks. I don't want to do it again. The same thing goes for running. Once, once a week, if you want to run, walk, run, walk, and kind of slowly, you know, increase the time at which you're running and decrease the time at which you're walking, it's still progress to eventually get to, okay, I'm just running consistently without walking. Yeah, I don't want to say it's a rite of passage, but it's going to happen. Oh, yeah. Inevitable. When I first started running, I had shin splints, plantar fasciitis, knee issues, tight hips, uh, tight glutes. For the first couple maybe two to three years, Mm -hmm. honestly, off and on. I feel like there was always something that was hurting. Mm -hmm. Now I never get injured from running. Yeah. My, my, my body biomechanics have kind of just adapted, fallen into this rhythm and adapted. Like if you look at my running form, when I first started really running in 2017, 2018 Mm -hmm. compared to now, my body's just learned how to become more efficient Mm -hmm. while running. But I think that that was a really good observation. You said like, you know, your knee was hurt. So a lot of people instantly go to that knee and try to figure out, well, how do I foam roll the knee and how do I massage the knee? Well, if you follow it up, it's probably coming from a tight hip or a tight glute. So I think that's like one of the benefits of working with a professional or a physical therapist yep. um, where, where you think the issue might be and you try to solve. Most cases, it's not. it's not right there. <laughs> it's not. It's not my, my, again, I'm very fortunate to work with, uh, uh, Dr. Aaron Orshik, Squire University. Um, I remember I texted him, I 
text him like, hey, I broke me. It's like, what did you break this time? <laughs> I would run in. Um, so, I mean, again, he's one, he's one of the, I mean, personally, one of the people that I've learned a lot when it comes to like injury prevention or just, just I mean, just analyze an injury and learning because your shoulder hurt doesn't mean it's your shoulder because your knee hurt. It's typically a symptom of something else. And I think one, one thing I learned again from somebody that had a lot of knee issue from strength training. Also, I realized, okay, it's not my knee. It's actually limited external rotation of the hip somewhere. Now, once I start working on that, guess what? The knee went away. So oftentimes when I tell people when you like, when you notice something, try to look, okay, one, it's an opportunity for you to learn something new about, about your body. And oftentimes trying to find the connection to that joint. And those usually are the culprit of your injury, of the, the root cause of your injury. Then you can actually work on limiting that. So, no, I mean, it's, it's, and I think the side, I mean, one of the downside also is a lot of people trying to figure it out themselves. And I'm like, no, just, I mean, I know you have access to a lot of information, but oftentimes just get with a professional, let them diagnose whatever it's going on. You spend less time trying to figure it out yourself. You can actually design, I mean, devise, you know, an action plan and get back to doing what you want to do. Instead of, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of this too. I'm like, my YouTube search when I was like, when I was running, like, it's it literally IT bit syndrome. Like, it was like my top view videos was like, was that. I'm like, you know what? Maybe I should try to, you know, somebody that knows more than me. And it's an opportunity for me to learn. And that's one of the cool things about running too, uh, because I could easily have just, like, man, I, man, I just can't do it. Or, you know, I've just pushed my body. It's my limit of what my body can do. But again, it's almost like a conversation, like, okay, but I mean, why do you think? I mean, I knew it's not going to be easy. I knew this all going to be, this is why I want to get into, I want to do more running because I don't have any injuries, expose myself to a lot of injuries. I've had injuries in the past strength training, but when you're doing something new, you're pushing your body to to do something that's not used to. Inevitably, like you said, it's going to, you are going to, you know, expose, you to, like, expose yourself to injuries. It just comes down to the way I think you have to look at it from a psychological standpoint. It's an opportunity to learn something new about your body, how your body work, understand your body even more because it's going to, add more tools to your tool, uh, toolbox. Do you think it's easier to get injured from running as opposed to strength training? Um, yes. Yes. And personally, I mean, I'll speak from a personal um, um, standpoint also just because one, oftentimes, I will also say maybe it depends on what you start with first. So if you start with strength training first, a lot of movements that you're doing are so isolated, not dynamic in any, any way. And one thing I notice when it comes to um, my injury is, is um, it uh, isolates a lot of my single joint in movement that I'm barely not doing. I'm squatting. I'm, I mean, I'm not really focused on glute med when I know it's like one of my weakest part. Um, that's going to cause a lot of uh, other body parts to overcompensate, which eventually is going to lead to injury. So I think it depends on what you start, uh, start with. So I think if you start with strength training first, uh, you might potentially um, – Exposes a lot of injuries again because so dynamic in nature. There's a lot of unilateral movements that's occurring. Uh, you find a lot of weakness that you probably never really, you know, paid attention to because you focus on more of a strength training. Um, then vice versa, if you start, you know, you using those like you know single dynamic movement, then you add strength training to prevent you know you from getting injured um, injured uh, further down the line. So I would definitely say it's it's a reverse. If you start strength training first. Um, then you uh, expose yourself to uh, running, you potentially are going to expose yourself to getting hurt. But if you do it vice versa, I think you might be in the best position to, because most likely if you are strength training, if you're running and you're strength training, you're probably strength training just to keep yourself strong to do that running that you want to do, as opposed to the other way around where you run in now and you just find yourself, okay, it's just something challenging, something new, you're trying to figure it out. You're not, not necessarily doing it for the body composition uh, reason, you're just doing it for other reasons outside of body composition. And that will eventually, obviously, just tell you, like, hey, buddy, um, I'm kind of weak here. Pay attention to me. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I found that strength training that supports running is one of the best ways to prevent injuries. Absolutely. While running. If I think back to all the times I've been injured while weight training, mm -hmm. it's because I've been lazy. I haven't warmed up properly. Yep. You know, I, I go in the gym. I know I have 45 minutes to knock out this workout. I skip the warm up. I jump right into a heavy set tweak my back and then you're looking back on your life like fuck yep why did i skip that absolutely no i mean again i think i just literally just put a post up on instagram um talking about um you'd never see a professional athlete just put on a jersey put on a pads just run to the field and start playing the game um you, you don't see that ever so they spend enough time hours you know yes you're not a professional athlete but if you care about your performance in the gym you spend the time in making sure uh you 
you know, primed and properly ready to do exactly what you love to do. I know it's not sexy, it's not fun to do. And again, it's a habit that you have to cultivate, especially if you're starting on your fitness journey, uh, to make it a routine. So you won't be forced to make it a routine. And because you, you know, got hurt and you cannot do what you, you know, love to do. And again, I'm guilty of this too. It got me, you know, to a place where I got hurt. I'm like, okay, we need to stop paying attention to, to this little minor, uh, not so sexy detail that you make sure you have to do just to make sure you can perform your best. So, uh, but again, you know, that's a, that's a huge lesson that you learn, unfortunately, after, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the deed is already done. So that my job as a coach also is to make sure, you know, I'm trying to, or content creator is trying to like, yes, I understand there's so many things out there and warming up properly, it gets so confusing. I think if we can just pick, let's say one or two things that can add dynamically to your routine, it's better than doing nothing at all. Yeah, I have found that um, one of the best ways to mitigate risk of injury while running, it's like you said, it's slowly ramp up mm -hmm. running volume. Yeah. So a good rule of thumb for a lot of people is don't increase running mileage more than 10% yep. week over week. Uh, and that's like a really good just baseline starting point because what happens when you ramp up that training volume too fast, I mean, you got to think with, with weight training, mm -hmm. you're doing maybe 10 repetitions at a time. Yep. You're taking a rest, you're resetting, you go back into that set fresh with running. The stimulus might, I mean, there's so many more repetitions. Yep. Your feet are hitting the ground so many more times in 15, 30, 45, 60 minutes. Mm -hmm and it increases that risk of overuse injury and any sort of inefficiency is gonna be exposed. I've also found that by slowly increasing running volume, it allows your body to just fall into efficiencies. Yeah, adjust. So a lot of people wanna go into, you know, analyze their running form and then try to fix things. And anyone who's tried to be self-aware of themselves running and fixing their running while they're running, mm -hmm. it's so much harder. It is. Than like it is. Than you would think it is, and it feels awkward and uncomfortable. And then what you find is, you know, now you now like you're working on this one part of your form, and mm -hmm. you're neglecting another part. It, it's it's a it's a it's a full time job in itself. But again, it's one of those things like it's not sexy. It's something you have to do and try your best to make it um, as natural as possible. And not, I mean, one thing I mean again, uh, my pogo stick or you know or or learn how to pull instead of just like heel striking all the time. Uh, again, it's not natural for me because I mean, I'm doing the natural way and that's what got me like, you know, uh, to the place where I, you know, I got hurt. But again, the more obviously repetitiveness, uh, making sure it's a staple in the way I want to treat because I want to keep running for a while. I would love to challenge myself and not have my limiting factor be injury, um, of, which again, I understand is inevitable because the farther you push yourself or expose yourself or tell your body to do the things that it doesn't really want to do or naturally just want to do, it, you are potentially exposing yourself, and that's something I have to understand. I mean, I have to uh, live with, and I welcome. But at least I want to make sure I'm putting myself in a position to, you know, not have that happen. It's a, it's a task. Again, it's not the sexiest part. Everybody just want to, you know, I just want to go run. I just want to, I just want to go lift. Like, yeah, when we're younger, you probably can get away with that too, because you probably recover a little bit better. The older you get, the more time you get underneath that, the more bad habit you probably cultivate. But if you cultivate those habits right now. Uh, you can have that. It's it's a routine at this point. You don't even think about it. It's just a part of your routine that you just do. And that puts you in a place where you to show up, have a good time training, not worry about stress. Because, I mean, it's psychologically draining to just show up to the gym, want to train, or to show up running. I'm like, ah, not again. It's it's demoralizing. So I'll uh, put yourself in a position to one, to uh, one, make that. It's a habit then. It's not sexy. It's not fun. We all just want to, like, you know, hop out of the car and just, you know, hit the road and go running. Well, we all can do that. Uh, most people can do that at least. So uh, for the majority of people like me, need to like, make it, okay, I'm not gonna cheat myself. I'm not gonna skip a beat uh, because I know exactly what that's gonna lead me to. So now we know, you know, running is a big part of your life now or, or is becoming a bigger part of your life. Yeah. Um, but I wanna go back a little bit and talk about your competitive bodybuilding yeah. career and, and you achieving a, a pro natural card. Yeah. Um, when was it you started competing in bodybuilding? Because I would assume years before you actually started competing, you were you were training with the philosophies and intent of putting on size and strength. But when did you actually decide you wanted to start competing and why? Um, so the journey started uh, back in college. Again, I'm 
just like you mentioned earlier, I'd be showing up to the gym, uh, work out. I had my, I think my star major at the time was actually doing a show like in Korea. And he like was like, hey, uh, you want to compete? I'm like, no, like why? I don't want to be in tighties and, and speedos. I call it speedos now. I know it's very, you don't, it's not speedos. Posing trunk. It's posing trunk. Let's be clear about that. Uh, but I'm like, uh, nah, that's not for me. I just want to, you know, train and lift weight. And I got out, I went to school, I went to college. And uh, I really remember, again, I think I was, uh, the community of the people that I trained with or worked out with, everybody was just, I mean, it's a social gathering. It's, you know, at the rec center, everybody just working out. And my KMP teacher, uh, kinesiology teacher, was like, it's a huge pile of the dude, strong. It's like, hey, you ever thought about, you know, competing? Because you like, you had a you know, pretty decent physique. I mean, looking back, I'm like, I mean, sure, I guess. I mean, one, 190 soaking wet, I guess. And it's like, I'm like, uh, again, the lot of Speedos, no, like, I'm not going to do that. Somehow, um, again, the challenge there, again, it wasn't running, but I was looking for some different challenge. Like, oh, what the hell? I mean, back in, in college kid, I'm like, I, I mean, if I do it, I guess I'll look good for spring break. At least I'll get something something out of it. Is this post-military? Post-military. Okay. Yeah. And uh, back in college, and uh, there was a show called Greek Physique. Uh, do not look up Greek Physique. Simon Cano, Greek Physique. Like, I cringe anytime I watch that video. We all start somewhere. <laughs> uh, one of my friends wouldn't, like, make fun of me. He's like, oh, bro. I don't know, man. What were you doing there? Was I, this like a, a college? Oh, uh, a college, uh, college it was show? a fundraiser like show. Uh, posing was atrocious. I Heck mean, yeah. my side chest was gnarly. I'm to a side bend, upper upper wazoo. Anyways, <laughs> um, I did that and I won the show. Like you know, I, I think I did like a week prep or something like that. Chicken and broccoli and uh, peas. That was my main meat. Uh, tilapia. My roommate hated fish. Tilapia never again. Were you and, tracking nutrition or were you on like a meal oh, plan? Meal plan. Meal plan. I didn't. I'd have no. I mean. I'd, we died in what was that no like I, I remember my picking protocol it was i mean looking i really remember what the picking protocol was it was like frozen mango something to improve potassium i'm like sure so i'll do that and that's what i did uh but again i think i was lean enough and that just goes back to the concept that everybody can be starved and you you know you look good on stage but i was good enough to win the show and i think at the time the i mean Coming from the military where running was not a thing and I kind of want to go back to just, you know, strengthening. Like, this is kind of fun. This is a new challenge for me. This is fun. You mean I can dedicate X amount of time. I can, you know, want to quote unquote bulk or shred. You know, I can focus that effort on this and I can get this result. Like, oh, sign me up. And that's how it sort of kind of took off. And luckily for me at the time, uh, I went to Northern Illinois University. It was a local show, OCB show. It's at the time, I think Lane Norton competed. I, used to, I remember, I think the show, the show I competed, the first time I competed at that show, Lane, Lane Norton was a guest opposer for that show. And uh, I remember um, I, my Ryan Doris. Uh, oh, Ryan Doris, Ryan, yeah. Ryan Doris. Uh, that, so Ryan Doris actually coached me for the first like sanctioned show that I did. Natty Pro. Natty Pro himself. Uh, now turned uh, Pilates instructor. Um, <laughs> and... He coached me throughout the show. Uh, again, he's more knowledgeable at the time. You know, started learning flexible diet and my peaking protocols and things like that. And at the time, I was not really like, it's not something I didn't have like this like five, six year or desire to turn pro. It was just something I did just because it was challenging. I can dedicate X amount of time to mass, X amount of time to prep. And this is the result. Wherever the result is, I'll live with it, adjust. And again, it's that improvement that I was essentially just chasing after. And uh, I won my first pro show. Like my, uh, my I get my pro card on my first show, and I'm like, oh, okay. I think there might be something here. And uh, I took a, you know, I didn't want to do. I mean, I looking at what I did. So I seen Lee Norton at the time. I'm like he's massive. Like I can as a as an amateur term pro, there is no way I'm going to stand to that guy and be remotely like close to uh, being competitive. So I took a year and a half off. Uh, did my first pro show. Um, I got third in like a stacked lineup. I mean, it was, I mean, the Donovan Strong's, if you are like, you know, in a bodybuilding, natural bodybuilding realm, you know who Donovan Strong is, massive dude. Got second. The fact that I got second to him was like, whoa. And two, three weeks after that, I did another show called the IPA, IFPA, which was one of the, arguably at the time, one of the best natural bodybuilding shows at the time. Uh, competed for that show. Uh, I got second. So it's an improvement from third. So that alone, I'm like, okay, all right. I think we got a good pace here. And I thought I should have won that show, but I didn't win. Um, but again, it's one of those things. I think at that show particularly, that's why I re, I, one thing that happened at that second show that gave me this, uh, the way I've been, it's life kind of wolves. I mean, I mean, 
it's the parallel between conscious variable fitness into uh, life at the same time. It's like looking at things from an intrinsic intrinsic place. Um, I did. I lost the show not because you didn't like what I look like, or I lost the show because you know it's apples and oranges, right? But I'm like, okay, it's not, I didn't lose the show because of you or that. It's because you know me. Like, okay, what can I do to make myself better? Instead of like, man, they just didn't like me that day, or uh, man, I got robbed. Like, it was never my. And again, you, sure, I thought I could have won the show, but I think using that sort of mindset allows me to put, uh, put the ball in my court. Like I have that control instead of me saying, oh, you didn't give me the placing that I thought I deserved. I'm like, no, I am going to fix this. I am going to work on whatever improvement. Even though I, you know, looking back, I know like, I should have won that show, but I refuse to look at it from that way because again, I want that control to be something I can I mean, act on as opposed to like, I cannot control what you do or how you put that place in it. So I think, again, that's one thing I learned at the beginning of my bodybuilding career, and I carry that. And I've been using that mantra since, um, I think, done over like 20 shows, one over 16, including world title, and here we are. I mean, that's what I like about ownership, extreme ownership. I've talked about this before, but you'll see people, whether it's a bodybuilding show or it's a half marathon, full marathon, ultra, there's always like the post race or the post show recap. And whenever I see these posts go up and it first starts off with, you know, this is why I didn't get the time or the place that I wanted. It was windy. I had started cramping right away. My nutrition strategy fell off. The judges didn't like me. I'm like just own it. Just own the result and the outcome, learn from it and grow through that. I think, I mean, it's, I wish I could, I mean, I'll try, I'll try to package it up uh, for people to understand um, outside of the spectrum of just bodybuilding. Um, a lot of times when you're giving your power away by putting the blame on somebody else, if you analyze it, if somebody can give you like for, I mean, like for a fact, it's not your fault. But still, if you own that good or bad, it, it's, it does something to, to, to give you the control, to give you actionable items right away, okay, this X, Y, and Z, X, Y, and Z. And I guarantee because you did that, you are going to be better for it because you spend less time focusing on or being in that, you know, little, uh, you know, pity box and like, no, uh, that's, therefore, it's a win. You can't control the wind. Uh, it's rain. You can't control that. But what can you control? You can control literally it's one step at a time. Okay, what can I do better to improve that performance? Is it a psychological thing that I need to work on? Is it, you know, my approach that I need to work on? and not letting other external factors be the dictator of your progress. Like you own everything, the good, the bad. You own everything because that puts the ball in your control. You can fix that. You can design You can design a plan of action that you want to move forward with and you spend less time in that hole of, you know, blaming, no, I just didn't get that promotion because X, Y, and Z was just, you know, favoritism. Um, I didn't do well because the judges don't you know, like that look better. Possibly, if they do, it's a subjective sport. You can control that. But what you can control really is going to determine how better you're going to be the next time around, whatever that next goal is or the next job you're trying to, you know, uh, chase after. So extreme ownership, I mean, that's one of the things that I that I learned, you know, initially from bodybuilding. And again, that's carried on to everything I do, like, in my life. Like, no, I'm just like, huh. Oh. Yep, uh, we're gonna do better. Like that's it. Like I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna give. I. It's like you give. You give the power to something that you're literally powerless. You know, over the power is within me. And I think if you literally take the time to just sit back and realize, like, okay, I've been giving too much power to these external factors that literally I have no control over. What I can control is owning it. Either it's true or not, but I'm just gonna own it. The good and the bad, all me, and I'm gonna put an action moving forward. Yeah, focusing on the variables that you can control. Yep. So you said you took uh, a year and a half off uh, after those first couple shows. Yeah. Uh, what were you focusing on during that year and a half? Did you did you do a dirty bulk? Did you put on a lot of weight? Did you try to put on size? Oh yeah. Um, I mean, again, I I definitely dirty bulk. I was I was I was bragging about how big I was. I was like two two forty five, bro. All me. I mean, I creeping up there. What were and you on stage for those, those first couple of shows? 201. So you gained like 45 pounds. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, my structure, my structure, Doris, we were tested. Our, our structure, Doris and I, we all went to uh, Northern Illinois College of Business. Um, and literally every time we had classes, three, four classes, 
after each class, we go to this joint at Northern Illinois called Peter Pete's, uh, three double chickens, I mean, at least twice a day. On the Saturdays, we go to a China buffet and we just like max out for like two hours. Now, we know what I know now, I'm glad I did it that way. Because actually, looking back, I mean, that was the strongest I ever felt. Uh, that was, my performance was through the roof. Would I do the same thing now? Um, no, I will have a little more structure to it. But again, I think it, which which circles back to the to the mindset of like I think the culture now that you know our focus on like you know uh, body composition, you want to improve body composition. Uh, again, caught up in you know I want to be main gaining or I want to be shredded. If you truly want to improve your physique, you need to be spending more time in an environment that's going to allow you to do just that. And that's in a massive phase. Yes, you're not going to get sloppy. You can do it more structured way compared to what I mean what people used to do like myself back in the day. Now you know more information now. You can do a struct in a structured way that you don't have to go full send. Uh, but you want to spend more time in an environment that's going to allow you to build that lean tissue mass. And I put something on Instagram the other day too, asking um, um, a poll asking, which one is harder to do, to lose fat or to gain lean tissue mass? To gain lean tissue mass. Because the mechanism that's, mechanisms that's required for you to gain lean tissue mass is more than the mechanisms that's required for you to lose fat. Outside of being a caloric deficit, I will make an argument that somebody can pick a random program, train clo relatively close to failure, not being on a structured training program, and still see relatively good good result in the fat loss process. But when you're trying to gain lean tissue mass, you need to be in a caloric surplus. You need to ideally be in a good training program. Uh, recovery needs to be on point. I mean, there's a lot. I mean, genetics needs to be on point. I mean, you need to have the genetics for it. And maybe, even maybe, you might actually see some result, right? But so that's why I encourage all the clients, all younger guys, I mean, people that are working, like spend less time trying to chase after the shreds and focus on gym performance. And gym performance, by focusing on gym performance, allows you to focus on, okay, if I want to perform well in the gym, I need to make sure my nutrition is on point, my recovery is on point, uh, not, you know, maintaining, teetering, like on the edge of, I want to get shredded or I want to I want mask, like, no. And the main gaining argument is, if I give you, okay, you want to go 100 miles, I give you an option of a Vespa or a Bugatti Veyron. You choose a Bugatti because it gets there faster. Might not be the most, you know, energy efficient, but Vespa gets you there slower, but Bugatti gets you there faster. Bugatti is a version of massing. I mean, you want to put yourself in a position that's going to allow you to do just that and not sabotage yourself. And one of those, one of the cool things about, again, going back to that in between times, looking back now, I'm like, man, I'm glad I did that. And I understand how the, you know, the narrative now is people get caught up in like the shreds because you see social media, you just like can attach to that. But if you truly want to, especially younger lifters too, like you, I mean, the, the older you got, the older you are the uh, in, this, in this fitness space, the, le the, the less of an opportunity you have to get lean tissue mass because it slows down. So this is the prime time for you to actually invest in that not so, you know, shredded face or actually invest a lot of time in, in bulking and training and gym performance. But in the, in between that time, all me, bro, 245 bulk, full sand. But a training though, I mean, if I look back now, just looking back at the transition from what I, you know, the last show that I did compared to when I actually hopped back on stage, I was back on stage like 201 from like 192-ish, 195 when I competed from the first show, or oh, my last uh, show. And visibly you can see too, and I was not chasing after doing multiple shows back to back. I'm like, no, I need time to train, enjoy training, get stronger gym, focus on performance, focus on eating good. And then we'll see what we're working with when we strip the fat down. I would say we grew up in one of the best times for fitness. Absolutely. You know, if I think about when I first started really getting into it, 2008, 2009 is when I really started getting into fitness and bodybuilding and strength training. And it's before... I was introduced to flexible dieting mm -hmm. or if it fits your macros and I was just going to the gym, eating a caloric surplus and just like packing on size and strength. Yep. I didn't care about, about abs. I just wanted to get stronger and bigger. And then I was in college. That's when like YouTube fitness started and you know, Eric Helms and Alberto Nunez and Matt Ogus are talking mm -hmm. about flexible dieting and tracking macros. Yep. So you start learning about, tracking your food and using my fitness pal and changing your body composition yep. for those first couple of years of training from like 2008 until probably 2000 and 
you know, 16, 17 for me when I got, before I got in the army, mm-hmm. I was just packing on size, yep. eat, lift, eat, lift, eat, lift. Running at that point was like, that was getting in my way yeah. of putting on size. Yeah, because we're losing so much. No, I mean, I, I, I tell people all the time, like, man, I, I don't know if I would have improved now in this current like climate again, because obviously social media, everything's like, you know, the more aesthetic you are, the more following you probably get. And people are chasing after the shreds and things like that. And I, I, I kind of, I feel for the, you know, for the current, like, you know, generation people trying to get into the fitness because they're seeing that or to see maybe like guys who've been doing it for years, like, you know, wow, be I mean, leaner now outside of maybe for marketing to, you know, purposes because it works well into your, you know, whatever you sell uh, to the, uh, to the masses. But you probably most likely probably spend a decent amount of time before you got here. Like the older you get now, you spend that time just bulking, massing, cutting, bulking. You're doing the reverse. Uh, because again, it was not, you know, the the mainstream thing to do at a time. And again, like again, back to, you know, why everybody, everybody's recording content now at the gym. I mean, there was no recording content in the gym. Just show up, just train. I remember like training at the time was just like, it It was a hangout. Like I remember like the rec center in the college was like a bunch of dudes just working out. It was the best. It was, it was like, it was no cameras, no nothing. I Doris was recording a couple of content on YouTube at the time, just like documented content prep. But like, it wasn't like camera in your face or let me get this angle, or, let me get this thing. No, it was, it was amazing. I mean, it was lit, lit a social hour without the camera. I mean, it's a social hour now, but it's like, everybody's sharing each other on. I mean, it's, I go back to videos now and I'm like, man, that was, that, I mean, those were my pivotal like times that I can definitely say, oh, I made the most improvement in the gym, strength wise, uh, lean tissue mass gain. And I didn't care about shreds. I didn't care about oh, six pack. I just want to lift my buddies and go eat afterward. That's all I cared about in after school. But no, it's, I mean, I, I, it's very, very challenging. So the one I try to post content, I'm like, listen, the people that you're seeing out there that are shredded right now, that's not, Ideally, the best way for you to do it, I'm sure I guarantee they've been doing it for a while. They then for a while, meaning the era when, like, you know, there's no incentive to be, you know, shredded, so to speak. I just spend the time just getting jacked and lifting heavy weight. And, uh, and now it's like, okay, everybody's like, you know, chasing after the shreds because shreds sell, they have small to follow in. And then you realize for the younger guys, man, I've spent like valuable like time, like my, you know, my newbie gains, like that when I should be spending that in an environment that's going to allow me to actually be, you know, look back 10 years, like, man, whew, man, I capitalized on that time and you didn't waste it because you're trying to chase shreds. The shred is always going to be there. You can get shredded, but the lint tissue mask, man, that is, that is the work there. So, I mean, no, it's you. I mean, kudos to everybody trying out there. I know it's hard. Hey, I'm glad <laughs> I'm not in that position. I'm glad to have the era uh, that I, I started my fitness journey in because it's very pivotal to like look back and I'm like, okay, well, I think I did it the right way. So anytime I'm posting content now or I have clients, I'm like, listen, I know it gets hard. Like I'm, I'm the coach. I push clients like, no, if you don't have any sort of biofeedback that's telling us, okay, we should pull back. It's time for mini cut, meaning recovery. It's kind of like, you know, tanking a little bit, you know, intro workout, you know, uh, um, conditioning is starting to impact a little bit. Eating is becoming a chore and things like that. Those are the indications, okay, now it's a mini cut. And essentially the mini cut is just an opportunity for us to get back to a good place to keep massing from, not because we're chasing the shreds. We're mini cutting to get back to massing, not because we're chasing the shreds. And when they look back, I'm like, man, I'm glad we did that because two, three years from now, like look back, I'm like, that was the most amount of gains that I've made. And of course you're chasing that. Yes, you're still growing, but just not at the rate that you were when you first started. Yeah, I mean, I remember looking back and I didn't care about having abs. I cared about like, were my my sleeves being filled Holding out by my arms yep. and like, was my chest poking through my shirt, essentially. Doris and I, uh, <laughs> Doris and I, I tell this story all the time, Doris and I literally for one summer, uh, because sustaining was in summer school, uh, had a, a, a mess cycle called Operation Fit No Jeans. Like literally that was a girl again. I mean, so the, uh, the, the com- I mean, the combination of Doris and I was, I mean, match made in heaven. I he's got massive legs coming from track. My legs are not that great. I got a big upper body. So it's like, okay, got a big upper body. You got big legs. I want what you want. You want what I want. Let's collab and work this together. I mean, so, his legs are still absolutely it's massive. Still, it's, it's, I feel like they've doubled in size. It's not. It is. I, it, I bet it doesn't even train as much as it used to. <laughs> like again, genetically gifted, but at the same time, he tra- I mean, is strong. I remember like back in the day, when, I mean, seeing him do like five hundred pounds for rep it was like, but now it's like every that's like a casual rep for somebody in the gym. Shout out Russell. 
Um, um, and uh, I saw, I mean, we, we had the Operation Fit No Jeans and the goal literally was we were running Lane's uh, Power Hypertrophy uh, Adaptive, the fat, the, program, fat program. the fat program. I remember the fat program. We, we were running that for, for a while. And I remember vividly, like yesterday, I was bartending in college. I leaned over to grab a bottle and I ripped my pants. I was so excited. I'm like, yo, it happened. <laughs> <laughs> Called him, I was like, what happened? I ripped my pants. I was like, let's go. It was like the most excited I've been. I'm like, and it's like the same pants I've worn. And like, it's, you couldn't tell me anything. Like that alone, that was what we sought out for in the gym. And and looking back now, again, it's, it's such a pivotal like time in my fitness journey that you know that that's still like things I still learn as to use till today is just you know focusing on uh, performance in the gym. Outside of that, nothing else is going to add to my you know improvement. I know yes, I'm not going to be improving at the scale as I was back then, but I'm glad I put that time in. But that doesn't mean I'm, the job is done. I still work to at least still improve uh, the body composition. There's a lot to unpack. Um, you know, first off, you mentioned how hard it is to, to build lean tissue. And I do want to talk about that because mm -hmm. a lot of people look at me as a runner or a hybrid athlete and they think they haven't done their research or they don't know how long I've been training. Mm -hmm. They assume that I've put on this <laughs> size while running 60 to 100 mile weeks. And as we kind of preluded to, mm -hmm. and I spent the first six, seven, eight years of my fitness journey, mm -hmm. just putting on lean tissue yeah. and not running, avoiding running as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Then when I started running, I was still able to hold a lot of that lean tissue. I obviously lost some, but yeah. I had that foundation built. Yeah. What is your response to people who, you know, they want to start going to the gym and they're like, oh yeah, I'm going to try to put on 10 pounds of muscle this summer. Like how hard is it actually to gain lean tissue and what is a realistic uh, goal? Um, outside of uh, newbie gains, uh, even newbie gains, like it's very, very, I mean, not it's rare for you to put 10 pounds on uh, in a year. Um, over time, in a, let's say if you start training three, four years, you can look back saying, I used to, you know, look at data if you are um, encouraged enough to like, okay, let me get some body composition testing, uh, test done, see what my lean tissue mass when I first started, and then compare maybe two, three, four years later. If you think you're going to uh, put on 10 pounds in a year, that's delusional. And newbie gains, newbie gains are those when you first start strength training, yep. resistance training, yep. you're going to see gains pretty quickly, yep. but then those are going to kind of taper off. They taper off. That's why, again, I, I alluded to earlier, those are the prime time that you want to focus on. So I to all, I mean, anybody listening, like if you're just starting your fitness journey, uh, this might be, uh, you know, uh, a little, a little, a little nudge to like focus on gym performance, focus on eating, uh, put mass in instead of chasing the shreds. Um, again, I think people, realistically, people don't know what's realistic, right? Uh, or you don't understand what body fat percentage look like. You might see somebody like, oh, that's like 12% body fat. Or like, you don't even know that. It might look like 10. You don't even know what 10 pounds look like. So I, one, you trying to attach this arbitrary like number to like, oh, you get about 10 pounds of muscle. I'm like, you just assuming you get 10 pounds of muscle. So people can't take that narrative, run with it. And don't and never look back. So re yes, you are physically gonna see some changes uh, in you, but to you put that you know emphasis on a specific number, uh, that's not true. One and two is it, again like the reality of what's achievable is very skewed for a lot of people. People will see you like, oh my god, like there's no way guy like that can can be that big. I'm like, yeah, but he is without any sort of understanding of your genetics or your background, or they see what they see now and deem that impossible because whatever. X, Y, and Z already said, like it's not possible. So for you to go again, that's already skewed and you think that 10 pounds of muscle gain is not realistic. It could be, but at the same time, unless you put somebody in the lab, you take like, you know, critical measurements and that you can track that. But things, one, don't focus too much on 10 pounds of muscle. Body composition will change, especially if you're a newbie. Put yourself in a body, put yourself in a mass in face, uh, making sure you're training. Your, your strength progression in the gym is showing you pro progressing Inevitably speaking, if you attach those two together, those will lead to a significant amount of gains, especially on the beginning phases of your uh, fitness journey. Of course, it's gonna scale up as you get older. Uh, the rate of gain will slow down. It's not impossible. I've seen some pretty dramatic transformation naturally from newbie, like two, three year transformation. I'm like, whoa, like that was impressive. And that's because fortunately, maybe they were just 
fortunate enough to fall into the right hands of the right coach that can kind of guide them through the right, you know, doing it the right way, as opposed to not focusing on, you know, too much on, you know, um, on the shreds and focusing on actually gym performance and building lean tissue mass. So is it is it impossible? No, but oftentimes it's not true. But again, it's down to the new beginnings when you first started. That's the most amount of time you are going to gain the most amount of lean tissue mass. And that's where you want to literally throw all your eggs in that basket and focus on because later down the line, that's going to slow down. And you are going to look back like, man, I'm glad I did not miss out on that opportunity. So there was a gentleman that sent me a message a few weeks ago. And he said, hey, man, I, I, I train the exact same way you train. Mm. I eat the exact same way you eat, mm. but I don't look like you. I think there's there's two things that a lot of people are neglecting when they make that observation or comment. One, it's the time in which I've been training consistently. Mm-hmm. You know, it's been over a decade now, and genetics do play a large role Speak in someone's it. ability to to build a physique. Oh man! And uh, you want can you dive into that a little bit? Oh my god! Um, I feel like I've had the conversation this conversation like multiple times, like in the last week. Um, one, I have a saying, I have a saying, like, if you, uh, I, I don't get, uh, non natty called out a few times. And, uh, the joke, the joke was I'm, I'm pissed about that because what do you mean? Like, I don't look non natty. I want to look non natty, uh, because the badge of honor for me, it doesn't bu- bug me at all. It doesn't affect me at all. Um, and, and I think genetics play a massive role, a massive role. I mean, look at your dad. Look at your brother. You guys are just thick. You know, you pack on muscle easily. And you all of a sudden just negate that because, no, it's just impossible. And uh, I was watching um, uh, the Joe Rogan podcast and Kamara Usman was on it. And it was talking about, uh, again, because the guy allegation of like, you know, using PEDs and things like that. And uh, it made a, uh, it made a comment that only a Nigerian born dude would understand. I'm Nigerian. And it was like, do you know how many Kamaru Usman's and Francis Ngannou just walking around Nigeria right now? It's like you, that literally, like they don't have any idea of what PDs are. Like genetics play a massive role uh, in Sima, Obi, Ross. Like genet, those are look at the, look at the background and lineage, Nigerians. So what I'm trying to say is, you, your genetics is your genetics. You cannot change that. Um, so you have to put that into your account. You have to put years of training because you train like Nick Bear. doesn't mean you're going to look like Nick Bear because your genetics, your time of training, it's not the, it's not the same. Uh, it's not, you, you, and you should be proud of that. I feel like, you know, if you actually take, that should not be a discouraging thing for you. Um, you know, the conversation I had is, okay, so what if I tell you, okay, you can gain, I mean, people, most of the questions that I get in DM is like, people want like, you know, like definitive, like answer, like give me the timeline. If I train for three years, if I do this, if I do that, am I going to get here? And I'm like, no, I don't know if you're going to get there or not. So well, let's say if I have a magic eight ball and I'm like, okay, looking like um, on uh, the September of 22 um, in 2028, you will have reached your full genetic potential. If you know that information, then what? You're going to stop when you get there? Oh, job is done. Pack it up, boys. Let's go home. No, you're going to keep pushing that. So understand your limitation, but use that. And I think again, back to the point of you made earlier, as far as, you know, uh, coming up in a different era, uh, blindfold ignorance is a beautiful thing. Like I was the guy looking at a muscular development, development magazine, uh, looking at J colors and uh, Dexter Jackson's like meal plan and like strength training. I'm like, that's what I got to do to look 100%. like that. I mean, without the, the, the notion of like PEDs or anything like that, I was so like naive to think that if I eat, the same meals, a lot of meals, by the way, <laughs> again, which naturally puts you in a caloric surplus and train like that, relatively maybe overtraining sometimes, but still allowed me to, I mean, train close to failure most of the time. So those two alone and genetics, of course, allowed me to put myself in a position that's favorable for me to look back on that. I'm like, wow, I did spend that time wisely, but it's easy for me to negate that. And all of a sudden just, oh yeah, nope, that's impossible. I mean, the 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 qualification of what's natty or not nowadays is just, it's 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 funny. I was talking to Matt Ogles about this the other day. And again, back to the uh, Kamaru Usman analogy, is picture like a bunch of rich people sitting together around the table and looking at people that are not rich, like only if you knew what we know. Like that's how I, that's how I look at it. like, 
only if you know what I know, meaning you know what, yes, I have genetic potential, but imagine if you don't focus on that, if you know literally all you need to focus on is your training, your nutrition, making sure it's on point. You might look back 10 years from now and you'd be shocked and amazed of what you've literally accomplished in that 10 years without focusing on finding that limitation for yourself just to justify the reason why you're not X, Y, and Z. That's why I think, you know, ignorance is bliss. Oh, beautiful. And looking back to when we first started training, there's a lot of bro science out there, mm -hmm. but a lot of that bro science helped me achieve tremendous results. Absolutely. Because it was, it was simplified. Mm -hmm where there's so much information out now that can overcomplicate the decisions you, you try to make. Yeah, yep. it's, it's a paralysis by analysis. You know, if, if, we, if I simplify the way I approach training and nutrition mm -hmm. back in the day, eat a lot of food, focus on protein, train really hard. Those three things helped me achieve tremendous results. Absolutely. Now, over time, I've learned how to refine and adjust and you know, optimize certain aspects of my training, nutrition, mm -hmm. and life. But like, those are some of the best days. I mean, it's a, uh, it's, it's. I mean, I, I mean paralysis analysis is real. I'm mean, just like in anything that you want to do in life. And again, it's one of the 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 best and uh, the positive and negatives of having access to information. Human beings historically, we don't do well with uh, choices. The more choices we have, the more paralyzed we get. So, uh, but I think uh, the challenge for most people now is, you know, you have access to information. Uh, you collect those data, you collect those information, but you're missing the key point. You're not being a practitioner. You figure out what worked, keep that, whatever didn't work, throw that away and, and gather that. So I think, again, I keep going back to the era of like, yes, the Muscular Development Magazine, we were limited in information that we have. It was basic, it was straight to the point. But now, again, you get to the point of like, okay, there's so people saying this, but do that, but do this. But I think if you simplify the approach for yourself, keep it in the simplest form, you will see result, but unfortunately, the simplest form is not sexy. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not packaged in uh, you know this beautiful you know bow like in in fancy words. I'm like the more complicated it is, the the more interest. I mean, interesting. Uh, the the subject matter sounds like, uh, which again, I mean, it's again. I, I hate to be the uh, the old yelling in the cloud and like oh my god, like how things have changed. But I think if you just find yourself to you know okay, I'm gonna seek the information. Whatever information I find, I'm gonna Quick analysis, okay, I'm gonna take this and just apply that and see if it works. So what's not sexy, leaning into that, is spending years in a caloric surplus, packing on size and, and strength. Nope. A lot of people probably listening to this podcast are gonna say, I understand what I have to do, but I don't wanna do that, I wanna get lean. So I do wanna give some practical information, yeah. especially for you as a coach. Yeah. You know, at the time we're recording this, it's May, we're going into the summer. Yep. I just got done with my bodybuilding prep. Towards the end of that prep, I was messaging you frequently asking yeah. questions. And I started sucking towards the end of that prep. And one of the things that you said is you need to focus on protocols and strategies for fatigue management. I would love to talk about as people go into a diet, they're mm -hmm. trying to get leaner, whether mm -hmm. it's competition lean or beach lean, there's probably going to be some fatigue that is associated with a caloric deficit yep. in training. What are things that you do with, with clients, with athletes to help manage fatigue? So, um, again, I've been, um, I'm on this kick lately, like less is more, uh, less is more just begin. I mean, just to draw back into the conversation of, I think we get paralyzed because we think, I mean, we think again, I think the brain is, uh, is meant to look at things on a macro level and we miss like the small, you know, minute details. Uh, less is more thinking, okay, when you're struggling, when you have like a fat loss goal, ideally speaking, obviously you're doing a caloric deficit. And when you get to a place where you like, just like you're stuck and the rationale then is being, I need to do more. I need to do more cardio. I need to train harder. And a lot of times you need to do less because again, you got, got to understand once you are in a caloric deficit uh, alone, it's a stress inducing process because you're telling your body, hey, you know, to eat less than what it needs to maintain. Um, so when you do that over time, uh, there are times where you don't need to push it. You need to take the foot off the gas a little bit. And I'll give one of my clients as an example right now. It's um, uh, his name is Sam is competing for a show. Uh, we about eight weeks out. And literally, I mean, because we give ourselves enough time to prep. So if you're trying to get ready for the summer or get ready for a show, one of the biggest advice is to give yourself time. Don't rush the process because if you rush it, you find yourself just, you know, spinning your wheels and trying to just force the issue a little bit. So give yourself time. 
uh, to get to your goal. That's the number one advice I would give you. And two, when you get to the point where you give yourself enough time, you feel like, man, I'm doing one. I'm literally checking all the variables, uh, sleep, uh, maybe life stress, uh, uh, training stress. Again, the rationale of I need to do more, I need to do more. That might be just time for you to look at look at your training program. Ideally speaking, if you're on a structured training program, pull back a little bit on the volume, still you know maintain your intensity at which you're training, pull back your training volume, and that's an opportunity for you to do a diet break. And back to Sam and what we did, let's say that like in the last three weeks or so, we put him on a caloric maintenance and guess what? He's still losing weight. Obviously caloric maintenance, it's a revolving. It's not a fixed number. It's not a fixed space. And we keep increasing the food and it keep losing because again, we've accumulated so much diet fatigue for the last 12 weeks. And we plan for this uh, because we anticipate that to happen. Uh, so while you're going through your fat loss process, it gets to a space where you, I mean, it's natural to think, okay, if I want to lose more weight, I need to do more cardio. If I want to lose more weight, I need to eat less. Um, when you get to a place where, okay, from a strategy point, uh, you, I mean, there is a point where too low of a calorie is just too low. There is nothing else. And that's a good time for you to take a diet break. So how do you process this? How do you, you know, this, don't take it as a grain of salt. This is like, you know, general uh, rule of thumb that I want uh, uh, people to take away from this. Whatever calories you are uh, taking in, add maybe, you know, 200 to 250 calories on top of what you're taking in right now. Look at your training program, uh, cut the volume down. Maybe if you're doing three sets per muscle group, cut it down to two sets per muscle group. Run that for like a week or so and you track data, see your weight. And what you notice a lot of times is, wow, okay, you might, the weight might go up a little bit, obviously because you eat more volume. But in terms in terms of total caloric, uh, total uh, rate of loss for, uh, per week, you might see a downward trend on that scale. So one, Less, is, I mean, more is not always more. Sometimes less is less. I'm not saying four weeks into the diet, oh, oh my God, you know, I'm fatigued. I'm, you know, diet break. No, uh, you need to push yourself in a position where, okay, I think I've done everything I need to do now. Um, I need to take a diet break. And if you want to like create a more, I mean, put in a, in a trend, uh, meaning four, I'm going to do four weeks of hard diet or then a week of maintenance. And if you are on the edge of maybe you have a lot of body, you know, body fat to lose, um, for like somebody that's like 200 to 300 pounds, you have a lot of body fat to give. A good strategy that I typically use for those people is it's going to be aggressive in, the, in nature. You treat it like a mini cut because one, because you have so much body fat to lose, it's, it's a cycle throughout the whole time. You don't want to be in a caloric deficit for too long. Uh, you want to do it in a rinse and repeat fashion, meaning you spend in, let's say, eight, 10 weeks in a fat loss phase and you possibly spend half that time in a maintenance phase, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, uh, and you eventually get to the place where, wow, okay, this is a lot easier than I thought. But the biggest takeaway is a lot of time, uh, more is not always the answer. More cardio is not always the answer, especially if you are even looking at your uh, numbers and the scale, like, I don't think I could do more cardio. I'm already doing cardio six times a week. I'm already doing, you know, cardio seven times a week. I mean, what more can I do? That's your cue. It's like, take a step back, take a break, take a diet break, scale back on the training volume for a week or two, let your body come down off that stress, then you start slowly ramping back up. And one of the cool things about maintenance also just, you know, give you a new baseline to actually start working with, especially if you in introduce a maintenance and you see the trend going down, guess what? You start in a much higher calorie rate when you start to start digging again than you were before. So it's a little bit um, adaptive. It's a little bit, uh, it's gonna, it's still hard, but it just makes the whole process a little more adjustable. Yeah, I mean, like towards the end of my, my prep, I mean, my fatigue was high and stress was high. Yeah. And that last, the week before peak week, 195 so on the scale every day. Mm -hmm. Calories are 1,800. I was running. Nothing was changing. I started freaking out. Yeah. I was like, I'm broken. <laughs> Everything's broken. And then going into peak week, we removed running. We mm -hmm. replaced it with uh, incline you treadmill walk, walking. Yep. And I increased calories by about 300 a day. Amazing, right? And my weight went from 195 to 190 in that week. So just seeing like stress, that stress kind of just shed mm -hmm. and managing that fatigue saw great results. Yeah. If someone, you know, so I guess like the, the first thing to address is that if someone has weight they want to lose mm -hmm. and even significant body fat that they want to lose, yeah. And they want to do it in a healthy, sustainable approach. They still want to live their life. They want to go out with friends and family and have a social life. First step is giving yourself enough time to lose that weight. Yep. 
making that diet longer than expected or you planned for. Yep. And then introducing diet breaks. Yep. How often should someone introduce a diet break? So that's going to, uh, that's going to depend. So two ways you can do this. You can kind of just do it as you go or like plan for it. Like regardless of what happens, I'm going to die for 12 weeks, uh, eight to 12 weeks. Um, and again, you can call an audible if you get to a point where like, man, I'm struggling, like physically, you know, struggling. And I know that term uh, for somebody that in a diet phase, it's very, you know, you can emotionally, uh, you know, call it and like, oh, struggling, yeah, diet break. So again, it comes down to just one, being honest with yourself or just hire a coach that can, you know, allow you to take the emotional aspect of, of it. But if you want to do it yourself, um, give yourself the, okay, ha having a plan, it's amazing. Uh, 12 weeks, uh, let's say diet break, uh, um, fat loss. And within that 12 weeks, you want to spend at least one third of that time in, in, in a caloric fitness, especially on the extreme side of things. If you I have a lot of body fat to lose. On the, you know, somebody like, you know, like you, you're going to lose maybe 20 pounds or so. Uh, might be shorter than that. It might be eight weeks, uh, you know, uh, or you might be able to go a little bit longer because you don't have a lot of body fat to lose. The changes that your body's going through is not going to be as dramatic as somebody who has 260, 280 or whatever. I want to lose a lot of uh, bigger body fat to, to give. So that's typically a lot of the structure. So you want to structure uh, having a plan or sticking to the plan. I think it's the best route instead of just winging it. I'm, like, oh, I'm just going to pull through that when I need it. Because when you have it on paper, you actually know you force yourself to stick to that plan and that will put you in a, in, a, in a position to do that. And again, I think um, just to um, get, get a little more help help there for people that are, are struggling, uh, one of the biggest challenges, I mean, I look at I look at things that I do for a lot of clients, right? And especially on the lifestyle side, I coach content spray and I coach lifestyle. And one of the things that gives a lot of result really is my goal as a coach is not to overhaul any, everything that you're doing. Because a lot of change is very hard for a lot of people. Uh, the more things you change, the more res resistance people are going to be. My job is not to overhaul. My job is to find one thing or two things that we can definitely change in what you're doing. And that could be, okay, uh, how much are you walking right now? Or, you know, can we, you know, track your, you know, can we do a food journal? Uh, just one thing. I don't want to change. I don't want to have you do five things. which is going to be overwhelming. Just like new resolution is, for instance, you show up to the gym, you know, I'm going to train six days a week. You can't sustain that. If you've not been training for a while, you probably show up for six days a week for the first week and you realize your body's beat and it's like, oh my God, I feel terrible. I'm not going to show up again. So again, back to the concept of human beings. And I mean, we don't do well with a lot of choices. So I want to limit the amount of choices that you have to make, but those choices are going to be impactful and realize like, oh my goodness, like, wow, I don't really have to like overcomplicate the process. I can simplify the process by just saying, okay, I want to change Let's increase your, uh, your step count. Let's get 8K steps a day. If you normally sit down for six, eight hours a day, good. That's what we, that a metric that we can track. And food wise, we're not even going to focus on the film food. And you'd be amazed how much just that alone, the changes that I see on a scale, just by making that one simple change. And I think we live in a culture where also people, uh, again, you get overwhelmed because, my God, I mean, I, I hate to blame Hollywood, but again, most people that people listen to are people that are popular. You hear like, you know, I said like an, uh, an actor had a, this dramatic transformation, like, oh, tell me about your diet. Man, uh, four days or four hours a day, uh, I have to eat this and that. And and people hit them like, man, that's all I have to do? Like to get to that level, that seemed impossible. But again, these are the extreme cases. And most people like literally what you can do right now or just make that one or two change I'm just going to increase my step count. It doesn't take you much to wake up in the morning, go for a walk, uh, make sure you track your steps. Oh, I'm okay. If I normally eat like four times a day, I'm going to eat three times a day. Again, that eating three times a day, put you in a clock deficit. You move in more than you uh, were before. That's enough to actually see some changes on the scale. Yeah, a lot of those actors too who are, who are losing weight and body fat for a specific role, mm -hmm. they're doing that over the course of like three to four weeks. Yep. Like it's yep. just for like probably one day of shooting. Yep. They just need to look a certain way for a short period of time, and they go back to the normal way they were consuming and eating. Yeah, it's uh, it's I I made a reel, I made a reel on a uh, um uh Michael B Jordan. He was on the show. and was like, oh yeah, I train like you know. Granted, like the skill of the role he was training for was boxing. Of course, you have to be efficient. You have to look as natural when it comes to nutrition. It's like oh, broccoli again broccoli and, and a fish and like, you know, this diet, I'm like, and everybody think that's what they, you know, that's what they need to do to get there. Because if, if Michael B. Jordan looks like that, that's what I need to do. Like, no, it doesn't have to be that extreme. 
And of course, just like anything else, the more extreme it is, the harder it is for you to sustain it. That's why you find yourself back to square one because I'm like, I cannot maintain this. So, I mean, a lot of times, keep it simple. I mean, as simple as possible. Pick one variable to change at a time. Consistently do that. And when you feel when you you know track your data, track as much uh, information as much as possible. And when you track that information, your body is very uh, adaptive. Your body's going to adapt to the change. And then you can add another layer of things you want to add to that. I want to maybe do more. There's a, a variable that has to change. Decrease out, uh, decrease input, aka food. Reduce your calorie, or you want to increase output, aka do more. Uh, could be tracking steps. Uh, could be add calories. And the way I do cardio for clients, I don't believe. Uh, you should step master is the king or, or, or running is the king. I literally give you a set amount of calories. I'm like, I will let you choose that. I might give you like the marathon method, like want to be like zone two, whatever, you know, uh, track your heart rate or that standardized process is. You want to standardize, could be a watch tracker, could be a Fitbit, whatever that tracking system is. Track that. And that is what we're going to use to track how many calories you expend in through that quote unquote cardio, could be tobacco, could be whatever form that you enjoy that you can actually see yourself do consistently that is what I'm going to choose for you based on what you tell me you enjoy. Not because I tell you, no, this is the way, and this is the only way to get results. That Michael G, Michael B. Jordan comment made me think back to when I was in college and, you know, just like, it's kind of nostalgic thinking back to some of the bro science things Mm -hmm. that I followed and thought was correct. And I remember hearing that, uh, like healthy fats Mm -hmm. were great to incorporate back in your diet. So, you know, every night before going to bed, I would fill a tablespoon of olive oil <laughs> and I would drink it. One, to get more calories in, yeah. but two, to get more healthy fats. And yeah. I remember when the big thing was that tilapia thinned oh the skin. God. Oh, the thin the skin. Uh. You know, people, were, people were saying that if you ate more tilapia, it would thin your skin so you, mm. you look drier and leaner mm. and more vascular. Uh, the body beautiful forms. I was consuming <laughs> so much tilapia. I'd, I'd go to like Sam's Club and I'd get the big like 10 oh, pound bag of frozen tilapia. Coming out of your pores. <laughs> and I'd come home and uh, I'd put them all in a pan in my college apartment with my five other roommates. And yeah. I'd do like two sheets, you know, two pan sheets in the oven of tilapia and just lemon pepper. Oh my God. Mrs. Dash. Mrs. Dash. <laughs> sodium free. <laughs> Mrs. Dash, because sodium was bad for you. Man, yo, I mean, hey, man, hey, bro, science, man. I mean, thank God. Thank God uh, we live in a better, uh, at least um, you have more people that, you know, more knowledgeable and like their information is being shared out there. I mean, again, you don't know what you don't know. Sometimes, you know, you look back and like, man, like you got to learn somehow, right? You got to go through that and like, okay, well, this is what I was doing. But at least, I mean, you applied it, right? You didn't, you didn't, you didn't get paralyzed. Like, well, okay, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I got to do. But now you know not to do that because you have a better way of doing it. And I think, again, we get caught up in the space where, again, like just like anything in life, really, like we, we overanalyze too much. Sometimes you just got to take a step and, and, and shove on, man. Like it's, it's literally, it's that simple. Uh, might not be, don't wait for the perfect opportunity to like, oh my, oh, I got to make sure everything is, you know, dress right, dress, everything, I cross everything. Now I'm going to like, no, there's no perfect time to do anything. So figure it out as you go, you know, uh, understand, okay, this is what I did. Okay, this worked. This didn't work. Okay, whatever didn't work, put it to the side. Okay, I'm not going to work. I'm going to hold on to what work. What else can we add more on top of that? And that's literally, that's how you get better. That's how you evolve over time. How important do you think it is to have a training goal? Because, you know, the conversation we've had so far is between bodybuilding and running and training for half marathons or full marathons. And, you know, if we look at both of us over the last decade plus of training, we've, we've probably always had a fitness goal that mm-hmm. we were training for. Mm-hmm. How important do you think that is? Because there's a lot of people who just start training to train and they start running to run. But if I look at the, the times in my life where I've made the most progress mentally and physically Mm -hmm. through fitness, it's when I've had a pretty specific goal. How important do you think that is for people? It's it's crucial. It's crucial. I mean, again, I think uh, there's a difference between working out and training. And I, you know, and I, you know, I made a correlation correlation a while back. Like there, I mean, training, working out is, I'm just want to check the box. I want to show up. I want to feel good, which there's nothing wrong with that. I'm glad you're doing that. You know, it's better than, you know, you sitting at home and not doing anything. But then if you want to take that to a level because you care about, you know, actually improving uh, your body composition or challenging yourself even further, then you have to switch that mindset to, okay, training. And when training comes into play, that's when you need to be very particular. You need to come down to literally like the specificity of what you're trying to do. 
And that gives you almost like a true north. You're not just winging it. You're not just showing up and kind of just figuring out as you go. Like you have a specific goal. And that keeps you accountable too. That keeps you the fire burning in the gym because you're trying to chase after this thing. It could be you're trying to reach your first 300 pound bench or 315 pound or 400, four or five squat or, or whatever that goal curl X amount of weight or have a body composition or you can get a data. Okay, I want to add X amount of lean tissue mass on in the next 16 weeks. You collect the baseline data. This is what you have. And this is my goal for the next six weeks. I'm going to collect enough data uh, to make sure, okay, how far am I as a goal? Um, again, it's it, there's a difference between working out and training. If you care about training, having a goal is very pivotal. Uh, in one, keep yourself accountable uh, in the gym. If you find yourself now winging it, now, you know, even though when you don't want to do it, you will do it because you have a goal. You have something that you're chasing after and you like, you know, trying to approach, trying to get to, as opposed to, uh, I don't really have anything. I'm just going to show up. Uh, I, don't, I can miss a workout today because I don't have a goal. And I'll give a good example too. Uh, after the, I did a, the first uh, half marathon I did uh, five weeks ago, um, I had a goal of like, yes, that's what I want to do. Um, maybe in like in five weeks or so. I knew I had the fitness to at least finish a half marathon. Like, you know, how good the time is going to be? Uh, I don't know. And after that, I can I found myself on, on someone's like a rut. Not a rut, but like I am find myself casually just like, I'm going to sleep in a little bit. I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm okay to skip that one because I don't have a specific goal that I want to achieve. Right. And of course I had to, you know, come to Jesus and I'm like, okay, one shifted to the reason why I run because it's that moment of like conversation with myself. It's that moment of, okay, if I don't do it in the morning, I know for a fact I'm not going to do it later. Family, you know, life and things like that. And then, okay, even though it was a short period of time, like I show up, once I show up, I got out of bed on a Tuesday. I went for this four mile run. It was a great run. I was bragging to my wife. I'm like, man, that four mile was great. Like negative split on the last two miles. My legs feel heavy, but I look at my watch. I'm like, like a 750 pace. I'm like, what is going on? It's like, oh, I mean, do you want to do a half this weekend? I'm like, I, without even the decision, I'm like done doing it. Showed up, lo and behold, one of my best PR, PR on the run without, I mean, without, again, paralysis by analysis, I would have sat, sat there overthink the process. Ah, lost fitness a little bit. I only ran once a week. I'm like, I didn't even hesitate. I didn't even think twice. And I think which again puts less pressure on myself because I don't have this weight of like, oh my God, I, I got to do that. I'm like, I'm going to show up. I'm going to put myself in a position to challenge myself and I uh, figure it out as I go. And uh, I think one, that's one of the, I mean, I'm, I'm digressing a little bit. That's one of the beautiful things about running too that I found out is uh, running to me is a series of problem solving. I think maybe you agree with this too. Like that's the reason why I don't listen to music when I do longer runs. Mm -hmm. uh, just because I know a lot of listen to music because it's a form of distraction uh, for from running. Maybe maybe feel makes you feel good. But I realize the more distracted I am, the less in tune I'm with what my body is doing, and I need to be in tune with what my body is doing so I can you know mitigate whatever that you know issue is going to be a potential is good issue is going to be, and running just to like you know listen to music and my, you know, go out too hot because I'm vibing out and also run and running without music is just gives me that, that personal time. Like, you know, everything is within my ears. I'm not, you know, there's no uh, influence of some sort of music that's going to make me, you know, feel good or feel great. Like, no, I kind of want to, you know, own in and have that conversation and not find that sort of distraction and finding out like, no running is literally a series of problem solving. Like, okay, Huh. Ankles kind of you know, feel a little bit one, uh, funny, change the gait a little bit. Okay. Uh, quads a little bit like, you know, adjust this. And that in itself, it's a form of distraction. Like, you know, because being in tune, it's a positive ROI. That's one of the reasons, uh, reasons why um, I don't I don't listen to music when I run. Yeah. I don't listen to music when I run. Occasionally I'll listen to an audiobook. Same. Or a podcast. Same. Shorter runs. But I think what a lot of people don't realize with music is because I used to listen to music while, while I ran. Mm hmm. And what I found is, say, for example, I had to go out for an easy run. Mm -hmm. And that easy run, I was aiming towards a heart rate of 135 to 142-ish beats per minute. Mm -hmm. If you listen to a song that is 160 beats per minute, mm -hmm. you are naturally going to start running at that pace and cadence. Yep. So if you do want to listen to music while you run, you can go on Spotify. And Spotify actually has running playlists. Yep. Based cadence off wise. a range of cadence and yep. beats per minute, mm -hmm. genius. Yep, and it's amazing. And uh, and um, I was uh, I remember I was in Montana um, during um, 
was in Montana uh, running and I was uh, doing some work with uh, one of my uh, sponsors and I'm like, hey, guys, listen, I got I got, I got some miles. I got to log in. Like, I'm, I'm training. I'm like, oh, sure. We just kind of, you know, follow you around. And that, that, that was one of my first experience with like runners high also. And I, I think it got affected because I was listening to Airborne Cadence. <laughs> and I was, I, I was fired up. I'm like, for like, I was supposed to do 12. And like from mile like one to like mile eight, I mean, I was cruising. I mean, I was, I mean, running, I'm like, ooh, run is high. I, I told the best feelings in the world. I mean, it's, it's hard. It's one of those, it's hard to explain until you've, if you experience it, like, I know what it's talking about. Like, if you, he's floating. I mean, effortless. I mean, I'm me just cruising in, which led me to bunking like the last like three miles. But like for that eight though, I mean, it was one of the out of body surreal could be the location in, in like the hills of Montana too. I don't know, whatever it is, but I can, I know for a fact the military cadence again, it's sort of like, you know, the airborne shuffle that comes on. I mean, it kind of allows you to kind of just like rhythm out, you know, the run a little bit, but it was a little bit too fast. I'm like, no, I'm just going to bask in this joy, you know, whatever leads me, I'm just going to follow. And I literally have to shut the music down like eight miles. Like, man, this, I mean, this, this, and the last, I think the last three miles, like 11 something pace. I was heard in because I send it for like yeah. eight miles. So, but yeah, I, I've, I've cried on runs before. It is, it is. I, I heard you say that for like a while back and I'm like, I, 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 I know, I mean, that, that was the run for me and it's hard to explain out about experience. It is. And that's, it's almost you chasing that again. Like I'm, I'm chasing it, and yeah. I found out again. Like the 18 miles that I did, that was like another one. That was not. That was just a different. Like I mean, I literally, I, it's just, it's something. Like I was like, I'm screaming. People are like, what, what is wrong with this guy? Like this guy's nuts. I'm like, yes, I am. Oh, I've, I, I've had it before. Where you're screaming out loud. I'm like, I want to bottle this, put it in a bottle, and just like take a sip of it, like every time. And it was, I mean, it's again, it's one of those people. That, I mean, one of those beautiful things about running that I cannot bottle it up and give it to you. You got to go out there. And fortunately, maybe you're fortunate. Fortunately, it's usually at the end of doing something hard, something difficult. That doesn't happen when you're laying in bed and just come, I mean, comfortably just chilling, just hanging out. No, you do something hard, whatever that hard is for you. I guarantee you, you have a similar experience. And that just puts a level of trajectory and a projection into like into your life, into that week. I was writing that high for like a month straight. Like, I mean, and then the 18, the 15 miles even came and I'm like, you just like, I just want to feel that thing again. I just want to feel it again. And that's why, you know, when you look at your shoes, I'm like, I just want, I want, I want to have as many moments as that so I can tap in if I need to, or like, you know, bottle that thing. And sometimes I want to shake people. I'm like, you too can have this. Like, yeah. just, 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 just try a little bit harder. But again, it's hard to explain. And people that are listening that have gone through that experience, like, man, I know what you're talking about. And that it's a drug. I mean, it's a it's a high that you always chasing, and if you don't have it, like man, I I hope the next one is it. And I mean, you you find you trying to strive, and at the time of that twelve month, that was the longest mile I've run in like in months. So if you if you if if this sounds something that you know, it's not a drug you can buy at the store. Like no, they, I mean, they don't give it out for free. You have to do something extremely hard out of your element, something that's uncomfortable for you for you to actually get that. And if you do, man. It's beautiful. The best part about that feeling too, I think for a lot of people that have never experienced that, it seems so far fetched and unrealistic, but it is earned. Where like you have to log a certain amount of miles, and you have to spend a certain amount of time on your feet, mm -hmm. and you don't know when it's going to come. It comes out of nowhere. But like it's not your first run, it's not your second run, it's not nope. your tenth run. It's like. Nope. You have to just spend time on your feet running. Yep. And at some point, all these conditions come together at the, the perfect time, the perfect place. And it's like, it's out of this body experience. It's, I mean, the closest I got was like, again, the last um, half that I did. And I mean, it was one, of the, one of the beautiful things about running also um, is just the community aspect of running. I mean, it's, it's unlike bodybuilding. Uh, I'll say that for a fact now. Um, again, the experience of like, you, I mean, you're on stage, people clapping for you, but running alone and people just like, you know, that energy is so, I think you saw, I talk about like, you know, Buffalo, like that energy was like, you know, like you can feel that. Yeah. And the same thing went for this run that I did like in uh, the um, Illinois, like uh, marathon or half marathon this past weekend. 
and the people that you meet, the community, the experience that you meet with people, like you, I mean, these are like core memories. Like you have like pictures and flashes, of like, you know, you just take all that, all the random, you know, connection that I made with some, you know, guy running his first marathon next to me. He's like, you mind if I tag on with you? I'm like, let's go, let's, let, let's, let's ride. And like having a conversation with him, like literally running up and I mean, while I'm trying to like, you know, just enjoying that, I mean, experience, I was less focused on the time. I was like, no, I'm just gonna live in this, you know, this moment, like I'm connecting with this guy. Or running and you know, and I saw this 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 woman, uh, just like with a uh, Iron Man tattoo like on the back of a leg, and I can just hear it in the back. I'm like, focus, focus, and that just ch- sends me chills. And I'm like, I, I mean, that energy literally, it's almost like transferred in like the last like a mile and a half when I was struggling a little bit, like you know, so my calf was cramping up. I'm like, okay, like I mean, it's I mean, it's something that that I cannot describe. Runners know exactly what I'm talking about. It's just that energy that you cannot recreate in any other sort of venue, especially almost like that, that join, uh, you know, shared misery also. We all suffering together. Mm-hmm. Like that is beautiful. Like on my long runs on the weekend, I see everybody doing this like loop and we were just like, you know, giving each other high fives and pounding. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, I was at the Buffalo New York Marathon last May. I mean, I showed up that race super dialed in. Mm-hmm. And I towed that starting line so focused Mm -hmm. like nothing was breaking my focus Mm -hmm. and the first like i believe six miles of that course it's you go out like two and a half miles and you loop back around Mm -hmm. and i went out in the front i was holding a 605 minute per mile pace Mm -hmm. so as i'm coming back around after two and a half miles i'm coming one way and all these other runners going the other way Mm -hmm. and all these other runners were saying going more going Mm -hmm. more going more to me and I was getting so jacked up. I was like, all right, like I'm not just running for myself right now. I'm running yeah. for this community. I'm running for this team. I'm running for go one more. Mm-hmm. And that that drove me so much. I was uh, with Jack, Crack, uh, Crack, um, uh, Crack Joe uh, over the weekend in Chicago. We did an eight mile on- uh, I saw that. Uh, yeah, I was, I was with him. And we literally just talked about that because he had this go one more hat on and was running. And we saw a couple of people and like, and it's almost like, it's, it's that nod. Like, yep. you know, it's almost like, I know what you're about. You and it. it's, I mean, it's called it stereotyping. Like I will, I love that stereotype. Like guys that look kind of, I look jacked, I look big and it's running like, ah, like it's almost, it's that, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's, again, it's, a, it's, I mean, it's a community thing. Like we all want to be a part of something and like seeing that alone is, I mean, every race you do, at least I see at least one or two go on my hats or the, um, the bandanas, um, it's 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 in, it's in, it's almost, I mean, you don't have to say much. You see it, you recognize it, and it's almost like go on more, go on more. Yeah, it's such. I mean, powerful phrase. So you know, hybrid when you see it. <laughs> it's 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 like, oh, yep, I know, oh, I know that guy. I know, I know, I know what you, I know what you're about. And it's 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 a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. From someone who has a bodybuilding background, mm-hmm. from someone who is a professional natural bodybuilder, how has your nutrition changed as you started running? Because for me, at least. I still eat like a bodybuilder and I always will, <laughs> right? I'm spacing my meals out. Protein is priority. Yep. Uh, I'm focusing on healthy fats and carbohydrates. I'm still consuming 225, 250 grams of protein a day. I yep. always will. So like a lot of what I learned about nutrition early on was based off of the way I was eating to build a certain body and physique. But what's different about bodybuilding and training for physique versus say performance and running is not many variables change with bodybuilding. Yeah. You know, a clear example is you're not going to be burning an extra 1,000 or 1,500 calories a day based yeah. off of output. Yep. But with running, you start incorporating and including these new variables that can change your caloric needs. How has your diet changed since running more? Just like you, didn't, didn't really change much. I still prioritize protein because, again, because I'm running, doesn't my my strength training hasn't really changed much. Um, my volume, when it comes to legs, obviously because that's what I'm using predominantly, has definitely shifted a little bit, but I've navigated that in my training program that I've, so I'll give you an example of what my structured training uh, program looks like. Longer runs on are on Saturdays. Uh, Sundays uh, are my day one. Uh, I'm training upper because my leg is still pretty, might be feeling pretty fatigued from the day before. And I found out by Monday I'm recovered enough to actually train legs again. Um, so, but what I, I mean, the most fatigued part of my legs is quads. Hamstrings typically fresh. 
Uh, so I'm going to put, um, uh, I'm focusing on my quads on, on Monday, uh, Tuesday, upper body session could be a pull session on uh, Wednesday, hamstrings. So I knock out the leg portion. So I have enough time for my leg and for fatigue to come down uh, before my next run again. Then I have a Thursday where it's just like, I know, uh, mobility, you know, uh, some core work day and Fridays to pick the shoulders, which is not really directly impacting my performance on Saturday. So that's my running training structure. Nutrition all day long stays the same. 250, 260 grams of protein, never break that. That's important to me because again, I'm still prioritizing wanting to gain, again, maintain at least or put myself in a position to gain lean tissue mass. And my calories throughout the week doesn't really change much. Again, my five mile, three, four, five mile run, like I run my easy runs or slow runs like Tuesdays and Thursdays, my longer runs. I run three times a week now. My longer runs are on Saturdays. My nutrition on those days don't really, doesn't really change much because I, I don't really feel the effect of those like small runs. So nothing really changes. But the only day that my nutrition typically would change is on Saturday post long runs. I'm still prioritizing nutrition. I'm still prioritizing protein, but I don't really track, but I just know I need calories. Uh, our calories, and I mean, I get, I mean, you get, which again, because uh, we're having a plan, can I have a plan? You can get carried away by just going to eat a bunch of stuff and yeah. like, for the sake of uh, just calories, calories, calories. I'm like, okay, really back, buddy. Let's focus on quality because again, when I focus on quality, I can see the benefits of just prioritizing those and making sure, you know, recovery is on point to get me ready to again to run on Tuesday. So overall, protein is king, like in my nutrition. And I'm a creature of habits too, literally on my meal, like every, I mean, my first four meals, I mean, throughout the day, the same thing every day. Same. Like, I don't, and not be, I mean, people might see that like, man, that's boring. Like, boring is, boring is amazing. Boring works. Boring gives me systems. Boring gives me structure that I can literally not, I, I can follow that to a T. And it's foods that I enjoy. It's not food I'm forced upon uh, to eat. Yes, everything else after like, you know, finish work around five o'clock might just be, you know, different. I think probably the same for you too. Yeah. But still the priority and the focus is still a lot of protein. Um, calories, I'm not really tracking calories, so to speak, but I'm aware because I've done it enough to understand or, you know, okay, this is, you know, I can ballpark, okay, this is where I'm at. Uh, if I want to manage running and like constant spread, for instance, yes, I might need to be a little more, you know, detailed as far as, you know, grams and protein and things like that. But overall, Protein is king on the longer runs, calories, but still focusing on the quality of the food, not just, oh, I'm going to just eat, you know, pizza and whatever, like, you know, just to get calories in. Because when I do that, yes, I recover, but I can tell the difference between, okay, prioritizing quality of the food uh, compared to just, oh, just get random calories in too. Yeah. First three meals of my day, every day are the same. And I look forward to those meals every single day. Every single day. And, I, and I think, uh, one thing I th also thought I thought about when you come, I mean, trans, I mean, coming into like the fat loss uh, process. And um, one thing I will encourage you, if your goal, I mean, again, because we get into the summer, people might you know want to be, uh, you know, get lean. Uh, one thing I tell people also, I'm a corporate guy. I work a corporate job, like most of most of most of you guys am I I'm listening. Um, I'm a dad. I got kids. Uh, one thing that helped me, and I've helped a lot of clients, is creating a structure. And the meals that I eat create, I have a structure uh, for myself. And if you're struggling in a fat loss journey, uh, one of the best things that I can uh, tell you um, is for you not to be food focused, is to stay busy. Uh, a busy mind is a less food focused mind. And I, I made the point initially that when uh, I'm a conscious prep, like literally sometimes I'm like so locked in, I get, I get, I start work, turn on my computer, grab my coffee, I'm sitting down, I eat a couple of protein bars, like, you know, I kick my day off with, I'm like so locked in into work. Because again, I'm putting out a bunch of fires that I sometimes like, oh crap, I, I got to eat. So if you find, you, I mean, if there's a project that's not maybe too energy demanding, something you can focus on and shift that focus on, not necessarily food, and that will definitely help you to stay less food focused and just find a system and a structure. Because I mean, if you find a system, you can standardize it, you can find a system. It's easy for you to repeat that without second guessing, overthinking it. You just literally, like, oh, just right. I mean, show up, bam, bam, bam. We just keep moving on. So uh, again, same same food that I eat. Not because you know, uh, you know, I'm stuck with it. No, it's food that I, I can uh, enjoy every single day. Like my first three, four meals, the same. The second meal, maybe like you know, eat with the family when I get home, and I have my end the day with like some sort of like you know, big protein, like you know, a meal. Like could be like a fire Greek yogurt or something like that, but like a scoop of like you know, cinnamon roll or something like that, some blueberries. And that's like my meal uh, at the end. Of the, and I love eating that. Call me boring, call it whatever. I don't, 
And somebody asked me like, hey, what's your favorite food? I'm like, I, I don't have one. I'm born, I'm born, I'm plain as they come. Like I don't crave like, oh my God, can I always have a large pizza? I, I just, I just, I look at food and literally feel. Not like, oh my God, I can always enjoy this. I don't have that thin. Yeah, like my favorite meal right now is rice, ground beef, Primal Kitchen's buffalo sauce, and pickled jalapenos. I've been eating that every day since prep's been over, and I look forward to that meal every single day. Keep it simple, man. And again, I think, Spock, I mean, I mean, not to keep hopping on nutrition, um, again, uh, with a flexible diet approach, right, you know, I think one of the side, side of, um, downside to a flexible diet, and it created this wave of people thinking, like, I'm just eat cheeseburger uh, as long as it fits my macros, and negate the fact that, no, the quality of the food still matters. So flexible dieting creating this opportunity, you know, I can just create the seven, six different ingredients in this, into this meal, and as long as it fits my macros, and it just complicates the process. And I mean, literally, how many times do you have to sit down and make food with like six, seven, simply, I mean, different ingredients for the sake of fitting my macros? The food you just mentioned just now, literally, you have three simple ingredients, and that's it. That simplifies that for you. Spend less time meal prepping. Uh, you don't, you're not looking for ways to kind of just, you know, pack as much stuff in as much as possible. Uh, find the foods that you enjoy. Find the foods that you can repeat. Uh, don't jump on a fad because it looks cool or sounds sex, sounds sexy. Uh, because if you cannot, if you jump on that fad, if you cannot structure that, if you cannot consistently see yourself doing it, years from now, it's probably a good sign to tell you that that's my, that might not be the plan for you. Yeah. So find the food that you eat right now. Eat less of it. You know, quality of the food matters. Simplify the food choices that you're making. And you know, yes, you can swap, you know, protein choices from time to time, you know, carb choices from time to time. If you focus on quality of the food, foods that you cook and prep for yourself, guaranteed chances are it's going to be very satiating and you're not going to be consuming as much calories as you think you were before. I think a lot of people that, that start running, I did the same thing. You overestimate how many calories you're actually burning during that exercise mm -hmm. and a lot of it's because our wearables tell yeah. us we burn x amount of calories which mm -hmm. is typically very inaccurate yeah i remember i would go downtown austin and i'd do the 10 mile loop mm -hmm. and i would run it like peak day in august in texas just like dying and after that run this is when i first started running i would go to whole foods downtown and i get like a large chunky monkey protein shake <laughs> i'd like fill my plate with like $40 worth of food on the hot bar. Recovery, bro. Yeah. And I was like, in my mind, I was thinking, I just burned so many calories. I My, my metabolism is ramped up. Yep. I got to I gotta eat as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And what happens with a lot of people is, you know, you start running potentially to lose weight mm -hmm. and you might even gain weight yep. because you're over consuming based off of, you know, this unrealistic calorie burn that you think you are yep. experiencing. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, it's again, I mean, I was, I was, new, I mean, I, as fresh as a year ago, I'm looking at my, oh, a thousand calories. Like that's almost like a, it's an approval. Like, yeah, go ahead, man. You know, send it, you know, get some, another meal. Yeah. You know, send it like, you know, my pizza, ah, psh, easy. Lot, that's a large pizza right there because I'm trying to replenish, trying to recover. And again, you, know, you learn real quick that uh, that's not what you really want. I mean, from the digestive standpoint too, like it's not, chances are it's not going to sit well in your stomach. You want to stick to the foods that you normally would eat anyways. And uh, and understanding that, again, has definitely helped in terms of like, you know, improving recovery or um, or not just, you know, and again, it's almost like a permission. It's like, oh yeah, you know, fuck around, you know, just eat whatever you want. And uh, learning that in a hard way and, you know, again, having a good coach at least, that, I mean, I you know better, but at the same time, it, you think, you know, I mean, man, I just burn a lot of calories, got to recover. And that's like, you know, you know, whatever, Calories is the name of the game. Like not calories, it calories is the name of the game. But the quality and the quality, yeah. the quality of the meal still matters. So uh, learning that the hard way, and I can definitely tell. You know, making that switch, I can definitely tell the difference in between. Okay, a large pizza or like you know a China, you know Chinese food or something like that because it packs a lot of calories. Uh, it's not the route, and I still want to focus on okay, prioritizing protein, uh, which I never really used to do. Like you know post post run, but. You know, Again, from somebody imagine somebody that I know better as a coach, understand me, understand you know macronutrients and in recovery, still making that mistake, and I'm like thinking, okay, that's not the route because dynamics are changing in performance uh, uh, from strength performance to more of a. I will not do that when it comes to strength performance. Why should I do something like that when it comes to you know 
uh, cardiovascular endurance and things like that, they should be relatively the same because the name of the game is recovery. What gives you the best chance of recovery? Making sure you're providing proper nutrients for your body, for your body to actually recover and show up for yourself the next day. That's actually, that's a great observation. I did that same thing in the beginning. Uh, when I first started running, I made that mistake of not including protein in my post workout run. Yeah. And I think a lot of the, the theory behind it is, you know, when you think of running, at least me mm -hmm. running, you are using muscle glycogen. Yeah. You want to restore and you want to restore muscle glycogen in those muscles post workout. Well, forget the repair part. <laughs> exactly. And you just, you forget about the protein. So you, you gravitate towards carbohydrate sources mm -hmm. to replenish glycogen, but and you were also just working those muscles during that run. So you yep. need protein as well to support Absolutely. recovery. And I mean, I mean, I know, I mean, I might change a little bit from time to time because obviously protein is very satiated. And by least I want to make sure the least, the, you know, the least amount of requirement for me has been met for that day. At least 220 is like my minimum requirement I want to hit. If I go over and beyond on that, great. Like, you know, trace macros and things like that. But prioritizing, you know, not just having like a free fall day, like not just send it and make sure, okay, post run, protein, that's the first thing. I make my nice little smoothie, you know, put a couple of, I mean, put some berries in there, honey, peanut butter, and all that stuff, make a nice little smoothie. And that's what I kick my day off with. And the rest, for the rest of the day, I'm still prioritizing. And essentially, to find myself just eating normally, maybe like the last meal or so, might just be more volume of like rice or potatoes or things like that than I normally would, I mean, well, would not eat throughout the week because I don't have that sort of output compared to like my longer runs. Yeah. Well, Sam, I appreciate you making the trip here. Of course. Sharing a lot of your insight. You know, you've gained so much wisdom and information through years of competitive bodybuilding, being a coach, now getting into running and, and kind of applying all the things you've learned to that. Um, so I appreciate you sharing a lot of information oh, today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been, uh, it's been a long time coming. Uh, you know, there's no better place to share that than here. Uh, you know, the, the good one, I said, I mean, run has been a very, uh, impactful, um, thing for me, which again, is something like, you know, I found, I didn't think it was going to be this thin. And again, you don't know what you don't know. And you got to put yourself in position to, you know, figure, you know, figure things like that out. So well, thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, it's been a, it's been a fun chat. Well, thanks, man. Thank you. That's a wrap. <laughs>